we were just shutting down, putting food out for the cats. I turn my back and I hear a sound I've never heard before from one of my cats, just sort of a, a police siren sound. Um, so I went to go see and our special little idiot <laughs> had tried to jump down from a box she was on and she got her toe caught in it oh. as she was coming down. So her front feet weren't quite on the floor um, and she was just freaking out and making incredible noises and like I wanted to reach down and help her but it would be like sticking my hand in a blender she was just everywhere and so I did the only thing I could think in the moment which is that I booted her <laughs> off of this and it worked she got free and she went and hid behind the couch and she was fine but I thought in that moment is this not an example of how God helps me sometimes I'm glad to see you, <laughs> glad to be here. This has been a tough week for me, to be really transparent. Tough week, but I'm glad we're both here. I'm glad you're here, I'm always glad to open the Bible with you, and I'm just gonna get straight into it. You know, I have some things I wanna share, but we can't go wrong by just opening the Word of God. It's always gonna be a good idea. I've been reminded of that this week. We've been reading through the book of Acts. We're about two-thirds of the way through now. We're following the third major journey of our brother, the Apostle Paul. In this section, we see sort of an interesting set of contrasts. I'm calling this message the way of hate and love. I don't really have any bullets beyond that. But this whole sermon series, we've been calling it the way, right? Because that's what Christians were called before anyone invented the word Christian. They were called followers of the way. So we've been looking at the way that the first churches got started, the way they were set up, the way they thrived and leaned into a relationship with Jesus. That was truly radical, and I appreciate Brian mentioned this last week. You know, these days, Christianity, certainly in America, is seen as, like, conformist. Um, but when Jesus first kicked this snowball down the hill, first kicked this cat off the box, it was radically different from culture. And honestly, I would say it still is, at its heart. Whatever someone may think about the Christian church and the Christian community, whatever. But what Jesus taught... And what the Bible says is still profoundly contrasting to the norms and values of culture at large. And Jesus still stirs up a lot of animosity, a lot of hate. But he is alive. Our God is alive, and he's still preaching the gospel, the good news of the love of God. So please open your Bibles with me, and we're going to see it. We're in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. It's a big chunk of text, so if you have an app, you may be served rather than the tiny, tiny text on our screen. It goes like this. Now when they, and we'll talk about who they are, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea 
but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Please pray with me as we begin today. Oh, goodness, Lord, thank you for this difficult week. It's been beautiful and hard days. Thank you for everything that you've been teaching me in life and in this text. And I just ask that you make today profitable for everybody who has come out to hear from you, myself included. Just preach to us today and let our hearts be open to receive it. Help us to search the scriptures to see if these things are true and receive your word with all eagerness. Mm. Calm and quiet our pride and our distraction and help us just lay everything down and for this time focus on you. What do you have for us? Confront us, correct us, instruct us, transform us by the power of Jesus to the glory of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. And everybody said, amen. amen. Right. So just a little context. Paul is traveling with two bros, Silas and Timothy. They're going from town to town to tell people about Jesus. And specifically, they're speaking in Jewish synagogues. Why? Because the Jews are the ones with the Torah that's been promising a savior for all these thousands of years. So they're traveling around going, good news, he came. He finally came, and there's salvation in his name. And there's a kingdom he's building that's greater than any kingdom of the world, and he wants us to be a part of it. Good news. And so today we see two stops on Paul's trip, one in Thessalonica, the other in Beria. They're both in Greece. They both still exist. You can visit them today. And the first stop, it says Paul stayed there for three consecutive Saturdays, he went to the synagogue and he presents them the gospel of Jesus. And he didn't just say, hey, Jesus is great. He did all these great things. That's true, but that's not the approach he takes. It says he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And this, to me, is one of the cornerstones of the faith. The Bible is consistent. It's consistent. People will say, oh, you know, so many different authors. Yep, except no. Because different human hands, many hundreds of years, one author. And the Bible is not just God's list of rules to follow. It's so much more than that. If that's all we see, we're missing God's character. We're missing God's mission. That's so much smaller than the story that God is telling about his love for us. So Paul engages with these people going, hey, we both agree the Bible you know, the, the, the Old Testament is God's word and that it's true, but do you know who it's pointing to? Do you know why he gave it to us? Ephesians 3, 24 says, therefore the law, like the Old Testament and all those rules and everything, was our tutor or teacher to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. That's the New King James Version translation. I like it. The law was our tutor. Like the reason we were given, you know, all the books of the Old Testament was to point to Christ. Paul's tack is always to ask, what can we agree on? We're going to see it next week too, because Paul goes and preaches to the Greeks in Athens who don't believe in the authority of Scripture. He goes, okay, well, what do we agree on? And he works from that to get to Christ, because all of creation preaches Jesus. But here, Paul presents the proofs in Scripture to the Thessalonians, and it says many of them believed. It specifically calls out the leading women of the city were some of the first converts, and they were persuaded by Paul's teaching. But unfortunately, things turn sour. Some of the Jewish religious leaders get jealous. I think maybe they feel Paul is taking away their people. It's like, well, they're not your people. They're God's people. I mean, you're, you're a shepherd working for a landowner, right, in this analogy. We have some friends of Streamsong who are now attending other churches. Like, imagine, imagine if when Living Hope opened in Doylestown that we started going, they're taking our people! And we tried to stir up like a mob to go run them out. But that's what they do. 
They form a mob, and they try and physically assault Paul. And Paul and Silas and Timothy, they slip away by night and continue their journey down the road to Berea. And there Paul follows the same pattern. He says to them, open your Bibles with me. Let's take a look. I'll show you what I'm seeing. I'll show you the roadmap that leads to the cross. It's all right here. And the comment of the author, where it says these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, I think this is important. There's been a terrible history, just to be honest, of anti-Semitism in many parts of the church. The Bible is not anti-Semitic. Jesus was a Jew. He followed the whole of the Jewish law. He kept every statute. I think people like to reduce things sometimes, you know, just broadly categories. Uh, are these people good or bad? It's not how God sees us. God does not divide us into good and bad. There are two categories that God uses, but it's Jesus and people who need him. Those are God's categories, right? The Bible doesn't say Jews are bad. The Bible says Jews need Jesus, and non-Jews need Jesus, and Hindus need Jesus, and Muslims need Jesus. Christians need Jesus. Because I'll tell you, for every example in Scripture of a Jewish leader opposing Christ or persecuting Paul, there's about a thousand examples from right now of Christian religious leaders who maybe also aren't making the most noble decisions. Everybody needs him. Everybody needs him. That's the message. And the nobility of the Berians wasn't that they instantly believed. This is interesting, too. It's that they were willing to honestly hear Paul out and then honestly look into it to see if it was true. It says they were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't come at it with an agenda. They didn't bring all their preferences and just look for justification of what they already thought. This is something about the Bible, too, right? Like, if you, when you read the Bible, I believe you'll find what you're looking for. I know somebody back in Seattle who reads the Bible every year. They're an atheist, and they read it for ammunition. You'll find it. If you read the Bible looking for reasons to discount God, reasons to dismiss Jesus, you'll find it. If you read the Bible looking for truth, and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives, you'll find it. Because we find what we're looking for. And they were looking to see if these things were so. They were willing to have their minds opened and expanded. They were willing to receive truth. That's what made them noble. But here we get to the real meat and potatoes of this scripture. Because it says, many of them therefore believed, but not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. I love how... Luke says that. But then when the Jews from Thessalonica learn that the people of Berea are receiving it, like, they freak out. They freak out. And they travel all the way there, like, three days by foot to stop this thing from happening. This is like, we're like, what? Living Hope's in Dublin, too? Let's go! This is the core of our look at the way of hate and love. Because what's going on here? This passage reveals to us a truth. And it's that the Jewish leaders in Thessalonica weren't actually, like their opposition was not to the message of Paul. This has become personal. Their opposition is to Paul. Like, it's a commitment to make this journey. But they hate him so much that not only do they run him out of town, but when they hear the next town over, nothing to do with them has received him, they won't stand for it. And we see it reinforced. Because just after this, in the text, what do we see? All three of our missionaries that left Thessalonica, right? Who leaves Berea? Just Paul. Only Paul leaves Berea. Paul recognizes this opposition isn't actually to the message that's being shared. It's to me. And this is an echo of what happened with Jesus. Like, they didn't just oppose his message. They opposed him. 
Jesus warns his followers in John 15, 18. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. He says later, John 17, 14, of his followers, I have given them your word, talking to God, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. The message of God stirs something deep inside us because of who it's from and who we're from. It plucks this cord that vibrates in our soul, but the reaction to it differs. Because for some people, it provokes a reaction of love, like in Beria. But for others, it provokes a reaction of hate, like in Thessalonica. It's primal, because it goes back to the beginning. When we turned away from God in Genesis, that choice echoed across creation. And we decided that we wanted to be the judge. We wanted to decide what was right and what was wrong. We don't want God to be God. We want to be God. To our own destruction, even, we will not bend the knee. And it's about authority. And this mindset that at its core rejects God and his message and his messenger because it threatens our authority. It threatens our authority, or at least our illusion of it. It says the church leaders in Thessalonica hated Paul because they were jealous. James explains it. James chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Like aggressive opposition. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he, God, yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Jealously. God is jealous for us. Why? We bear his image. He made us to bear his image, and he's jealous for us. But in trying to dethrone him, we become jealous for ourselves. This is like, if you have a dog, and you buy them a toy, and then they decide that they're the only one allowed to play with it. And if you have this situation happen, my mom's dog was like that, such a sweetheart. But if you approach that bone, <laughs> she was jealous. Like, you only have that bone because I gave it to you. Don't you think I might have something else good for you? <laughs> Jealous over what she decided was hers. But God is jealous too over what really is his. The final piece of this fascinating encounter is what Paul shows us when he leaves Berea. And that is that the love of God is not the opposite of the hate of the world. This is interesting. Because just like we tend to categorize and reduce, we like to think in opposites. Feels good, feels simple. Opposites, hot and cold, light and dark, world of opposites. Except as our resident science teacher will tell you, neither of those things are opposites. Like there's no power of dark, right? There's photons or the absence of photons. You can't have like a dark light. <laughs> that was for you. There's no force of cold. It's the absence of molecular motion. And in this sense, love and hate are not opposites because they don't balance each other out. They're not opposites. In fact, they have a lot in common because love and hate are both about passion. They're both about passion. But worldly hate is passion with the absence of grace. I'll pause for a minute, because that sounds profound. I think most of you know that I got notified this week by my work that I'm being laid off. And it was a very cold decision. Or it was a decision with very little molecular motion, Mr. Plate. But it's been a really tough week. 
It's been a tough week. I've been there 10 years. And I've been processing through it. And I want to say thank you, first of all. A lot of people have been praying for me, and I've felt it, and I need it. But I had an experience this week. A good friend of mine at work has also been hit by these layoffs, a lot of people. But this is like my best work friend. And we were talking on the phone, just kind of comforting one another. And he says, you know, there's just, I'm so mad about this. I'm so mad. You get that feeling where you just want to burn everything down? Not literally, but there's, there's all these projects and documentations and things that I've been working on, he tells me. And with the way they treated me, why don't I just delete that? Why don't I just burn it down? I mean, they just said, we don't need you. And I thought about that. And it was clear that his mindset was from passion. But I preached the gospel to him. What are they going to do, fire me? I told him, look, the world is always going to say, repay hurt for hurt. If you shove me, I want to shove you back. And I don't even have to think about it. It's instinctive. I want to prove that I have power. I want to lift up myself and my value. I want to crown my pride. And it's self-destructive. It's self-consuming. It's a system winding itself down into emptiness because hurting you doesn't undo the hurt that I received. I didn't say it this well on the phone, by the way. This is after I had time to write. <laughs> but I told him, you will never find the solution so long as you look within the systems of this world. You have to look outside this self-consuming system. That's what happened when Jesus came. Heaven invaded the world. He cracked it open so that light could shine through on this rescue mission. And when Christ died on the cross, God's word says the veil of the temple, the physical symbol of the separation between humanity and God was torn. How? From top to bottom. From top to bottom. From God reaching down to us with grace. Grace is what transforms worldly hate into Christly love. Grace is what transformed Paul from a passionate persecutor of the church to the most passionate proclaimer of the gospel. Same passion transformed by grace. Channeled to be a blessing. And that grace-fueled love is what allows Paul to leave. That's what allows him to leave, because the world would say, well, they're my enemies. I need to stay and fight them. Paul says, oh, they're, they're just opposed to me and not the message of the good news of Jesus? Great! Timothy, Silas, stay behind. Get this church going. Catch up with you soon. And the mission of Jesus marches on. Paul is free. This grace sets him free. He's free to leave. He's free to leave. He's free not to assert his own pride. He doesn't need to prove he has power because of the power of Jesus. Paul doesn't need to lift up his own value. Because God has said, I declare your value, and I'm jealous for it. And he doesn't need to protect his pride on a journey towards death. Instead, in humility, he can put his pride to death through the death of Christ, the all-sufficient sacrifice for our sin. And he can move towards life, towards Jesus, through the power of the resurrection made manifest in his life that we see here. Paul is free. And God's mission can't be stopped. The hatred of the world put Jesus on the cross. And the love of God turned that into grace. In closing today, I want these verses to encourage you. <clears throat> They've encouraged me this week. They've encouraged me. And I'm still wrestling. Man, it's hour to hour sometimes. It's a tough time. 
but I want to encourage your passion. I want to encourage your passion. We should be passionate. We should be a passionate people. The work party yesterday, as I was driving up to it, I was like, I can feel it. People are just passionate here. Everyone's out and helping, and it helped when the sun came out. That was nice. But we should be a passionate people. We should hurt with those who hurt. We should rejoice with those who rejoice. We should be moving forward and not stalling out. I thought about whether I should say this next part or not, because I may offend somebody. But I'm just going to say it. I honestly believe that God kind of prefers a passionate atheist to a lukewarm Christian. I think that, like a lukewarm lump of a stalled out churchgoer, because to steal from Mr. Plate again, twice in one sermon, it's a lot easier to steer a moving car. Because like passion, great, I can work with that. Let's bend it towards blessing. But lukewarm love. If you remember in Revelation, Jesus is like, that's a taste I want to spit out of my mouth. Wilhelm Stiekel was an Austrian psychologist. In 1921, just after World War I, he wrote, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. That quote was later made famous in an interview following the awarding of the Nobel Prize to author and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. So I want us to be encouraged to be passionate people. We are free to be passionate. I think this is something interesting. Okay, so this is, this is something for those of you who watch anime. I found my people. If you watch it like with the subtitles, it's a very different experience than if you watch it where it's like the voices have been replaced with American voice actors. The dub. The dub is weird. <laughs> it's weird because the kinds of things that our culture says it's okay to be passionate about are different than the kind of thing their culture says it's to be passionate about. So you, you hear voice actors trying to, trying to make it sound normal and it doesn't. Like, our culture very subtly tells us what it's okay to be passionate about. In America, it's okay to be very angry. That's about it. You know, for strong passion, right? People still laugh about how Tom Cruise, like, got up and was jumping on the couch on the Oprah show because he was really in love with somebody. It's like, that's weird. You know, if you think about Middle Eastern cultures, how people just publicly lament When's the last time you saw that here? Culture tells us what it's okay to be passionate about. And we don't even realize we're marching to the drumbeat. The gospel sets us free. And we're free to be passionate. Secondly, I want to encourage you to have Jesus' understanding of opposition. Jesus says, Luke 10, 16, the one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. I talked to somebody who told me that they got into a heated argument with someone else because that person verbally attacked Jesus. And they told me, well, I felt like I had to defend Jesus. That's backwards. I don't defend Jesus. Jesus defends me. Okay? I'm not Christ's bodyguard. I'm his messenger. Jesus is very honest. The world will frequently react with hostility to his message. When someone who is friends with the world 
and the systems of the world is told, you are not the ultimate authority, they can react very negatively. Jesus warned us, but we're never told, we're never told to pick a fight. We're never told, stay in there, slug it out. My mat shifted. Passion. We're free. The value that God declares we have and the power of Jesus set us free from being controlled by our pride in this way. We don't need to win. What can I win? What can I win beyond what Christ won for me on the cross? I can't add to that. And it sets me free. It sets me free. Finally, I want to encourage you with the nobility of the Berians. Everything that I have set up here, everything you hear from Brian, from the pulpit, don't just receive it blindly. And also don't reject it just because you disagree. Make it yours. Examine the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Make it yours. Pursue God with humility. Shepherd a heart that is open to being instructed by him, being corrected by him, transformed by him. Make it yours. And see, see as God uses your passion. God's going to use your passion to bless. I'll tell you something. That's my real job. That's my job. That's my actual job. The one I'm losing is a place God had me for a while. I made a list after that. I was really distraught. I made a list on my phone, a little checklist. Here's everything that I'm losing from this job. Health insurance, dental, vision, retirement, life insurance, prescription medication benefits. All of this stuff. I was like, ah, oh, look at what I'm losing. And then I had a chance to just take some time, and I got some good counsel, and I talked to God, and I went back, and I prayed over that list. I prayed over it, because my portion and my inheritance and my security and my worth come from Jesus Christ. My job was the vehicle through which God provided me with those things for a while. But my hope is in the sure promise of the blood shed by him for me. I prayed over that list and then I deleted it. Amen. Because on the cross, Jesus turned worldly hate the greatest act of love in the history of creation. How do I take my eyes off that? That's what's going to give me passion. Passion that can overcome the despair of the modern job search. Holy cow. It's rough out there. It's really rough. But I'm free. free. I have a job. And it's part of God's mission. And God's mission cannot be stopped. Please pray with me.